Gracious Father, thank you that by virtue of what we have received in Jesus, what you have given to us so freely, we are welcome in your presence. You open wide your arms to receive us. So allow us, God, by your grace, to be quieted in your presence, to receive the echoes of mercy about which we have sung. Work in us, Lord, that which you desire. Make room in us, Lord, for that which you desire to impart, both for us as well as through us. And so we do say, speak, Lord, your servants are listening. For it is in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord, that we pray. Amen. Amen. Please be seated. Henry Martin. It is only in the providence of God that a flaming missionary like Henry Martin would fall on this day as we give thanks together for the life and ministry that God has given us as clergy. He was born in 1781. He studied at Cambridge. Sorry, Peter, he's not an Oxford guy. But he won prizes for his brilliance, particularly in math. He had an incredible facility for languages. And as a burgeoning Christian, he began to wrestle with the issue of what was God asking of him. Providentially, he came under the tutelage, as we would say, the discipleship of Charles Simeon, who encouraged him not to stand for law, which was his intended profession, but instead to seek ordination. He did. He wound up in a very short amount of time moving to India. He became the translator of the New Testament in Hindi and in Persian, as well as the Book of Common Prayer. He revised the Arabic translation of the New Testament, translated the Psalter into Persian. In 1811, he left India for Persia, hoping to do further translations to improve his existing ones and enter into an evangelistic conversation with the Muslims, not unlike what St. Francis had done earlier. But traveling in those days was not a healthy occupation. He fell ill and he died in Armenia. 1812, he was 33 years of age. He never married. His whole life was given for the sake of the gospel. Because of his humility, his brilliance, and his profound Christian charity, he was honored in Armenia by the church there and buried with all of the honors typically do a significant bishop. He is one who was on fire for God. Here's what he wrote. I am born for God only. Christ is nearer to me than father or mother or sister. A near relation, he is a more affectionate friend. And I rejoice to follow him and to love him. Blessed Jesus, thou art all I want. A forerunner for me in all I shall ever go through. As a Christian, a minister, or a missionary, as we would add as the coda, who would want anything else? He said, finally, I, and it really sums up his life, I see no business in life but the work of Christ. Scholar, priest, missionary, someone whose translations still stand and open the door for the foundation of the church in India. So, of course, all of the lessons are about missions. Isaiah's call about the cry of the heart to create a cleansed heart within me. Why? So that I might be available for God and for his service. The wonderful summation of the gospel in Romans, that the heart of the gospel is to receive an imputed righteousness in Jesus, not of my own making, but of his free gift that, in fact, by God's action, makes me right with God. And then, of course, Jesus being the missionary to the Samaritan woman who talks about a faith not based in geography, but based in a relationship with the Father, worshiping him in spirit and in truth. 
a little bit about my story. I grew up in the church, baptized as an infant. I went away to college and said, thank God I don't have to go to church anymore. God knew differently. And in the midst of my freshman year of college, in the midst of a lot of wrestling that was going on among the people of that generation, we're talking about the early 1970s, there were questions about the legitimacy of American government, the anti-war movement, um, drugs, peace, all of that was flourishing. The capacity and the hunger to look for something other than what it was that we knew in the empty gardens of the suburban life that we had known. We were a generation of genuine privilege. And yet the fact of the matter is, for many of us, it came up empty. In the midst of all of that, I got invited to a Christian retreat. It was an interdenominational retreat, but held at Roslyn, which is the Episcopal Retreat Center in Richmond, Virginia, uh, my hometown. I had no idea in the world what to expect. And the only reason I said yes, at least at a conscious level, was that a woman invited me for whom I had tremendous respect. Her name was Bruce, an odd first name for a woman, but they were all family names. The South is like that. Um, <laughs> Bruce Crane Fisher. Bruce's family were, were heirs of Crane Plumbing. Her dad had been an international ambassador and she was a champion in the city of Richmond for civil rights. Uh, she was the one that single-handedly invited the very first female artist to ever perform at the concert hall called the mosque because it had that kind of quasi-Arabic architecture. And she, Marian Anderson was her name, and she continued to sort of push her peers in Richmond to think more openly than they had been about the issues of civil rights. It was because of that that I met her. I had been invited to join a burgeoning group called Sing Out. Sing Out was an, not a Christian organization, but it was a Christian, it was an organization that believed deeply in civil and racial equality and called people to love and care for one another across racial and socioeconomic divides. It was exactly what this hungry for meaning 14 year old, that's how old I was, uh, needed in the midst of particularly the emptiness of what I had known in my own family. You see, I must confess to you that the desire to do this conference is not just for me something that I observe out there as something that we need to address, but it's profoundly personal. Uh, I had a violent and often abusive father. There was at least one occasion in my life that I remember very clearly of genuine sexual assault. And my mother, the proper Southern lady, if there ever was one, never uttered a single protest. And she knew. And so I, like anyone who has had that kind of background, actually grow up grows up thinking, what's wrong with me? Why has this happened to me? Did I do something to somehow provoke it? Because I noticed a very distinct difference in the way I was treated versus the way my, my younger siblings were. I'm the oldest of four. And so I couldn't wait to get out of the house. That was the real story. And when this invitation came from a good friend of mine who said, Greg, we need a piano player. And I've played piano all my life. I said, I jumped at the chance. Plus, I loved the idea of actually kind of getting into it and trying to think creatively and prayerfully, which we did, about what did it mean to witness, particularly in the divided South, about a God who cared for everyone, no matter who they were. So I, I got into it. What I didn't know was that one of the main philanthropic supporters was a woman named Bruce Fisher, so that's how we met. And Bruce was a profoundly committed, believing Christian. And she and I began to have conversations. She began to invite me over to her home, along with another young man by the name of Jeff. And we would sit and talk with her. It was, to me, quite honestly, an honor. I had never met anyone quite like her 
because she was so at home in her faith. There was no pretension whatsoever. And she had a lot of reasons to be pretentious if she'd actually wanted to, but thankfully she knew better. And she was as at ease with us as anybody I had ever known. And she was the one that wound up inviting me to that retreat at Roslyn where God broke in and changed my life. Um, I didn't expect it. I didn't even even know that I needed it. But I met people like I'd never met before who had this genuine, easy, gentle, uh, full of joy love of Jesus that I had not seen. And it awakened hunger in me like I'd never experienced before. And they were very wise. I would come up and I would say, so tell me, what makes you like you are? And they would just smile and say, oh, it's Jesus. And then they changed the subject. And they did because they knew just in our conversations that I was a debater. I wanted to take somebody on and prove them wrong. And they were wise enough to recognize in this 18-year-old upstart that what they needed to do was to just sort of give me to God and let God handle it. And that's exactly what happened. Uh, on the evening before we were to adjourn the next day, we, as is often the case in these kinds of retreats, there was an altar call. Anybody could come up to the rail, and it was an Episcopal chapel, so you would come and kneel, and you'd be prayed for, laying on of hands. So at that point, my response, quite honestly, was still a lot more uh, flip than I would re readily acknowledge. Truth be told, I was nervous. But what I, my conscious mind said was, what do you have to lose? And so I walked up and I knelt, and they're praying for people, and they finally get to me, and they pray for me, and they go to the next person. And I want to confess to you that in that moment, nothing consciously happened at all. And I stood up and I said, is this just a fake? And I walked out. In fact, a friend of mine there who I knew named Bill, uh, I turned to him and he said, Bill, I'm leaving. My parents' house was only a mile and a half away from the retreat center. I could have easily driven home. But what I did instead was I walked outside, and this is this kind of mammoth estate overlooking the James River. I walked down the hill to the James, and I just stood there and I kind of looked up at the stars and I said, God, I don't know what's going on right now. But what I do know is that if what people say, say about you is true, I need you. That was the first time I had ever admitted any need for God. And it was like God was just waiting because as soon as I had that, it was as if, and it was, you know, I, I can never claim hearing an audible voice. But it was such a profound experience in that moment, I really felt like I heard God say, get on your knees. And without even thinking about whether there was mud down there on the riverbank or not, I was down on my knees. And in that moment of yielding, I really was flooded with, pre with the peace of God. And I began to make my way back up the hill, back up to the chapel where the services was, were just wrapping up. And, and I just about danced in the doorway. I went back to school and tried to put together what it is that had happened to me. I had no idea. I was completely unprepared at one level for how to process what was going on. But the Lord very wisely led me to wise Christians who clearly saw that God was at work in my life. And as a result, I wound up being, as a college student, a Christian leader on my campus. But there was one drawback. The drawback was, I really didn't know the Father. I had, in essence, split the Trinity. Jesus was my rescuer. He was the forgiver of my sins, the conqueror of all demonic power, of all, because I dabbled in demonic power, I must tell you. And in all other ways, knowing that he was the true conqueror, but God for me, particularly the whole idea of God the Father, was a gray cloud on the horizon that I did not want to face. I went all through college that way. I sailed through the uh, discernment process 
at my local Episcopal church for ordination. And um, I went to seminary to VTS. And it really wasn't until my second year that I sat down with a friend of mine just to talk. One of the gifts of residential seminary is that your best theological conversations are after 10 o'clock at night. The later, the better, and beer helps. And that's what we were doing. And the man, but I, what I didn't know was that that sort of invitation to talk, which he had extended, and I was looking forward to it, I liked him quite a lot, was, was in fact an invitation to hear from the Lord. Because as we're just chattering, I mean, it was chatter. Um, he said to me, and he, his voice even changed, he said, you know, when I hear you talk about God, here's what comes to mind. It's like you're on a high wire. That, yeah, you believe in Jesus, but you're up there and you are all by yourself. You have a balance beam. There's a net underneath you. That's grace. But it's all up to you to get from point A to point B. And it was, again, one of those occasions where I thought, I think I just heard God speak to me. And it sent me on a quest because I realized that what had happened was typical of a lot of people, particularly if they have broken relationships with their fathers, is that they superimpose on God the picture and the experience that they had had of their earthly dads. So Jesus was my rescuer, the one who intercedes on my behalf before the Father so I don't have to. And so the whole idea of Jesus being an invitation to come into a new relationship with the Father where we would worship him in spirit and in truth was absolutely beyond anything I could imagine. And so what I did in that moment is I began to see what had happened, that I had in essence created an idol of my own making and called it God, was to confess that in fact what I had done was commit idolatry and that I renounced that idol, and I asked God to show me who he really was. And that, for me, was, in fact, the beginning. It has continued to take a very long time for me to be at home with my father and to feel within him the description of what we sang in Blessed Assurance Perfect submission, all is at rest. I and my Savior am happy and blessed. I, I really could never sing that song in a good con with a good conscience, even though I knew I loved Jesus, because I knew there was another shoe to drop, and that was the Father. So for me to hear again, even in the gospel reading tonight, Jesus speaking to this Samaritan woman, that what really matters is not geographic location, But in fact, what really matters is that God is raising up a new generation of worshipers. That's what God is doing, who will worship him in spirit and in truth, for the Father seeks such to worship him. I even could give you the exegetical understanding of the text, but that didn't mean that it had penetrated into my heart. All it did was convict me of what I did not know. And I did not know how to know it until that conversation where I realized that in essence, I was worshiping an idol, an idol of my own making and an idol to whom I owed no obeisance whatsoever. So tonight, as we come into this, it's not just a question of being shaped in a way that I might have a negative impact on someone else or what's going on in congregations, abuse and abusers. It's much more foundational than that. The real question of a conference like this for me and for you as my sister and brother clergy is, do you know the father of whom Jesus speaks? Are you at peace in his presence? Do you actually know in your gut that God has imparted to you through his son a righteousness for which you paid nothing. And Jesus has paid everything. 
and that it's never a question of earning anyone's love in terms of God the Father by virtue of what it is that you're trying to do. Because the downside is if you don't know the Father in spirit and in truth, what your heart will believe, even if you can quote scripture to the contrary, is that it really is about trying to measure up to this God whom I don't know very well. Because that's what more often than not, fatherhood has taught us. A relationship that expects everything. And it is poison in our preaching. It is poison in our souls. And it robs us of the peace that passes all understanding. To know that I can literally stand before him and hear the collect for purity every single Sunday. All hearts are open, all desires known, from whom no secrets are hid. And hear it as relief. There is someone who knows all of who I am and has received me into himself, grafted me into the vine, worked in me that which is indissoluble, child of God, inheritor of the kingdom. Because beloved, that is the place of joy. That is the place of adventure. If Martin did not know that, I doubt if he would be able to write the way he did, go against all of the presuppositions of his class, and take off and do the kinds of adventurous things that he was able to do, eschew the call to marriage, give himself completely to his Father in heaven, and know that whatever happened to him, even in the strange, odd places of India and Persia, particularly, remember, we're talking the 18th century, he knew that God would keep him. And he knew that to the very end. To the extent that you know the great power of being kept by a God who absolutely holds you rock solid in his hand, gives you the courage and the capacity to take risks with people, with institutions, with even the matters of truth in a way that is not possible if you're still playing to an audience hoping they will like you. And that is the fruit of not knowing God the Father. Because if you know his profound, his profound inclusion and acceptance of you, blood bought by the Lamb, if you know that, you can face anybody. And believe me, if you know that, you will. Because God is seeking such to worship him and a witness for him. May God raise up here and in other places people like Martin who will help the rest of us gain the courage to know that we can in fact walk that same path because we honor and worship the same Father. Amen.